Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back to the Games for Change stage, Eric Huey. <laughs> Feel like I'm at a hockey game. Uh, thank you, thank you for that introduction. Uh, I'm Eric Huey, I'm the Senior Vice President of uh, the Entertainment Software Association, and we're thrilled uh, to, to kick it into the afternoon and talk a little bit about funding, because you've heard a lot about great games, why they work, why they are, are, are so effective in education and uh, as, a, as a tool for, for change and for impact. Now we're gonna talk to some folks who actually design games and have to uh, apply for funding and how they sustain those games through the funding cycle and beyond, and we're also gonna talk to some funders themselves. So we would like to op uh, welcome to the stage, I believe in order, Ed Metz. Mark Ruppel. Karen Helmerson. Clara Fernandez-Vara. And Nick Fortuno. So who are these people? <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> they have much more comfortable and accommodating chairs than I, I, I do. No, but we're here to support you. You're all good. <laughs> um, Ed, Ed is the program, uh, program manager for SBIR programs at the U.S. Department of Education. Mark is the senior program officer for the National Endowment for the Humanities. Karen is the program director for electronic media, film, and visual art at NYSCA. Clara is associate arts professor at NYU and a game designer. Nick is the co-founder and CCO of Playmatics, also a game designer. Um, why don't we start off by talking to the funders? Um, everybody needs money to make a game. And, it, and, and in the games for education space, in the games for impact space, it can be difficult uh, to, to, to find funding. Uh, it can be, um, I mean, there's Kickstarters, there are, other th there are other means available, but it's a different type of, of, of um, of funding cycle, it's a different type of re return on investment, if you will, for for the funders. So I'd love to uh, maybe Ed start, and, and we'll sort of go down the line. Talk about talk about how you view this. What are the challenges, uh, the, the the various criteria that you use to evaluate these projects, and the success that the, the, the and, and and maybe some of the not successes that you've that you've dealt with. Great, thanks so much, Eric. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, well, I mean, if I was here ten years ago. Uh, I would have told you um, to apply to the Department of Education's SBIR program, but don't use the word game. <laughs> it was a different uh, world we were living in, a different universe. Um, the word game would have probably resulted in a, a low score. Um, but nowadays, uh, the, you know, my, how things have changed. So um, the Department of Education's Small Business Innovation Research Program provides funding to small business entrepreneurs to develop uh, education technology products to help students learn or to enrich teacher instruction. And uh, the awards are for $150,000 for the development of a prototype and $900,000 for the full-scale development. So you could get a phase one award, show your prototype, and then go on to the phase two. So the, uh, the great news is it's, um, it's what's called non-dilutive funding. The government does not uh, take any of your IP. You get to keep all of your IP and the goal is that you commercialize your game. So the past five years or so, or six years, we've funded uh, companies such as Filament Games, Brainquake, Shell Games, Teachly, Electric Fun Stuff, Mindset Works, Sokicom, um, some, some hopefully of the strongest uh, education uh, technology games out there. So the great news is that uh, this program is there for you. Um, the not so great news is um, our funding rate is, is, is on the low side. Um, we got 246 proposals last year and made nine phase one awards, so less than 5%. Um, so that, that is the troubling part about a government uh, funding program is that you can spend a lot of time doing an application and then have a very low hit rate. Um, the good news is hopefully our application process, if it's your first time, um, will make you think about some of the develop the needs to develop a technology and to do the research. Maybe it will help you form your team. Maybe it will help you engage your stakeholders, um, which is a critical part of your process. So those things might not be front and center, but if you do the application, it will need to be. The second thing is our, if you don't get the award, our reviewers will, um, will give you feedback, which could be very useful as well. 
So that's a very broad overview. There's a second funding program at the Institute of Education Sciences where I work. Uh, it's a, it's for mostly for academics, but um, it also could be for, for developers. So please uh, let me know if you want more information on that. I'll provide it to you. Terrific. Thanks, Ed. Mark, what about at NEH? How, how do you guys approach this space historically, and how has that evolved over time, and what type of projects are you evaluating these days? So we are the NEH. Uh, that's the Humanities Endowment. Uh, we are a federal agency, the largest funder of the humanities in the country. Um, but I'm guessing a lot of you haven't had the humanities defined for you lately. So I think that's not a bad place to start. So the humanities, roughly speaking, are any disciplines that really deal directly in human experience. So we're talking about history, literature, philosophy, civics, jurisprudence, things like that. So on the one hand, what we deal in are, in some sense, academic disciplines. But on the other hand, what we really deal in, too, are approaches or processes to approaching a topic or a subject, an event, um, a particular way of thinking or an educational goal. So to that end, we offer quite a bit of support at the NEH for different types of game projects. And I'll list the ones that I'm least direct, directly involved in first because they've touched on things that I think already have uh, happened here at the conference. So our Office of Digital Humanities um, has offered support in the past for something along the lines of what Christopher Weaver spoke about today in archiving the history of video games. But in this case, we were actually looking at preserving the software, preserving the interactions, so preserving what's taking place on a World of Warcraft server as it happens, alongside preserving Miss Pac-Man and making sure that each of the 90 or so iterations of the game have some kind of future vi vibrancy. Um, that also occurs in our Division of Preservation and Access too, where they're looking at digitizing um, artifacts related to video game history. But in my program, public programs, where we fund games primarily for the endowment, um, we deal in an, an enormous amount of, of range in terms of, of how we support projects in the humanities and what we support. Um, so some of our bread and butter programs traditionally were documentary films along the lines of the Ken Burns stuff that you may have been forced to watch or choose to watch. Um, but also museum exhibits, historic sites, things along those lines. Um, public programming through libraries um, and community spaces that may be humanity-centric in their own way. Uh, the, the program that's most directly relevant here, though, is one called Digital Projects for the Public. And it's our bread and butter, again, for games funding. Um, it's been around for only about three years, so it's a relatively young program. Um, and we've offered and we've awarded about two million in grants so far through the NEH to games. Um, but that's only because uh, of, of the limited number of applications that we received, at least initially. Um, so we have no set number uh, that we really look for each year in terms of budget for funding games. We want to make hard decisions. Um, and we've had to do so so far because we offer levels of support for games that really do scaffold in a lot of ways some stuff that Ed was talking about. We offer what's called a discovery grant. And it's something that's incredibly important, I think, to the process of game design and game development. And that what it does is essentially pay you to have conversations with both the scholars that may be involved on the content end of the team. And that's an important piece of the NEH puzzle. We need to have a content team. We need to have experts in the subject that you're studying. And then the media producers themselves. And we pay you to facilitate that conversation to move towards a design document that might be a blueprint or a credential moving forward. The next level that we offer support for is prototyping. And those grants are usually around $100,000. And they are to do exactly that, to take the proof of concept piece of your puzzle, of your pro project, excuse me, to really flesh it out, to experiment with it, to see what sticks and see what doesn't as a model for moving forward. And then finally, we do offer production funding, which is around $400,000. And that is for the late stage distribution, testing, um, outreach, and even publicity um, to surrounding your game. Uh, so we offer what we feel is, is a good range of support at all levels of the process. And it is a process, too. And unlike other funders, um, and I can't speak for the Department of Ed, the NEH is actually unique in that we work with you hand in hand to craft your proposal and in some sense to co-produce the project. So as you're building your team of academics, we oftentimes will suggest people or suggest fields that might benefit the project moving forward. Same goes on the media side of things. We might look towards approaches that might better suit your project, suggest partnerships with on-site spaces, for example, like a museum or a historic site that might benefit your outreach. And we do this up until the point of submission, at which point we do kind of wave goodbye and we're hands off for a bit until we, uh, we get a funding decision through. 
Also, like the Department of Ed, and this is something that we're quite proud of, you will receive comments from the reviewers. Your project can grow even if it's not funded, and in many cases, it grows substantially. We've seen a number of people come in with games projects that weren't quite there initially, whether that's on the content end or on the execution end, who through reviewer feedback wound up coming back in and getting funded and seeing their project take off. So there's an awful lot to it here, but it really does begin and end for us with that scholarly piece. You need to have the content experts on board. You need to figure out a process that will allow them to engage with the media team in a way that's not detrimental to the project. And that's oftentimes a big challenge for a lot of first-time applicants. How do you get something like history or fact-based knowledge involved in a game that somehow still allows for player agency? And how do you convince the historians that this is a vital approach? All of those sorts of things are things to consider for any age. And we really ask that you work with us from the beginning on framing those issues, even both within your team and for an audience outside of that. Terrific. Thanks, Mark. Now, Karen, we've heard from the, the, the federal folks, from New York State's perspective, what, what is it that you are looking for? What's your history been in terms of this, these types of projects? How do you evaluate things? And, and what, what's, coming across your, what's coming across your desk? And what is the role of the state, perhaps in, in, in cooperation in conjunction with the, the federal folks? Yeah, well, to be honest, I'd say we're a little bit of a newbie when it comes to working with game developers and game designers. Although uh, having uh, known Games for Change for a few years, uh, we're getting very excited about learning more and getting into supporting this field as much as we can. I would uh, also kind of piggyback a lot on Mark, take advantage of much of what he said structurally because the same kind of goes for the uh, New York State Council on the Arts. But what is different uh, is that as, I, I, I can't say as a state funder, but in our uh, state here, uh, we unfortunately do not have the level of funding that you've just heard that is available through education and humanities. Um, quick overview on that structure. We have two primary uh, programs for uh, media, if you will, media and film and, and uh, related research, but it's uh, the Individual Artist Program. Uh, anybody applied to NISCA for the Individual Artist Program ever here? That's interesting. Oh, okay, great, we got one. And then there is the Electronic Media and Film Program and the Visual Arts, which is what I oversee. The primary difference, again, here is that uh, New York State or NISCA is only able to give money to nonprofit organizations. So it is through, we do have the individual artist program, but they must be fiscally sponsored, and they must go through a nonprofit organization. Those grants under what we call IND are a maximum of $25,000. And again, obviously that's not, you know, going to go very far in some circumstances here, but what again it does do is some of the things that Mark was telling you about. It does allow for pre-production, it does allow for design, it does allow for a lot of early development work. Uh, we also have some finishing funds at smaller levels. We have a whole variety of things. What I'm really focusing on right now, though, uh, through the nonprofit sector, is organizations, media arts organizations, because one way I can tackle this problem of never having, well, one, not having enough money to begin with, and never having enough money, is by looking at the infrastructure and how to perhaps increase the portfolio, increase the number of people who are applying, and really help to educate the public, especially with the New York State, because of our mandate, to better understand the value of games, the designers, the developers, and the universe that we're moving into. And in this case, we have, um, on a practical level, supporting media arts uh, organizations that are exhibiting uh, games or projects or think tanks. Uh, I would say, you know, the New Museum is a great example. We support the uh, New Inc. at the New Museum. We're for-profit, not-for-profit, investment, and uh, creatives come together to uh, do any variety of preparatory work and even production there. But last night we had uh, NISCA, our first NISCA and Games for Change matchup, which was really very successful, and I can see a few people here uh, who were there last night. And what this was is, is the beginning, it's part of that recognition uh, here within New York State again, at least, that we need to get uh, a deeper dialogue going in order to generate that support that we really need and better understanding. So it's a cross-professional, cross-discipline opportunity to bring people together 
so they can begin meeting, collaborating, putting their talents together, having dialogue, and then with that dialogue, people that were there last night are actually el eligible to apply for convening grants, and that's something that you heard Mark talk about. It's like, how do you really build the infrastructure for dialogue and better understanding and cross-talent as well? So that's a lot of what I'm focusing on right now because uh, my portfolio, or rather my allocation, uh, is not really as large as I would like it to be. We also have art and technology initiatives. Again, it's where developing the nonprofit uh, media arts organization to su better support the field, to better support you, the individual makers, creators, um, by taking uh, small amounts of money to do nothing but what I call dream time, to sit back and imagine what it is that they would like to do that they've never done before in the area of art, technology, science, game development, and go away for a year, use this money to pay for whether it's staff or convening or facilities to do that thinking, come back, even possibly with a prototype or possibly with collaborations or these ideas, something tested, maybe something not tested, but just simply explore and experiment. And we also call it, well, I shouldn't call it the failure grant, but you know, it's really encouraging people to fail if they find that their idea isn't working. That's not the point. The point here, again, is because we're looking at new models of support, we're trying to develop new infrastructures through experimentation and dialogue, that even, even if the applicant fails, fine, all we want to know is why. Because why I'm finding through my portfolio or in my portfolio always leads to better understanding of where we're going. And that attempt is incredibly important. So this is just to give you a little bit of background on how through NISCA, Electronic Media and Film and Individual Artists, we're beginning to address really changing uh, the model of institution that we have uh, and that we're working with. And um, I'll stop there because that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, w w this underscores the symbiotic relationship between the federal government and the states and the communities and the artists. And the, fun the symbiotic relationship, particularly in, 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 in the nonprofit or the impact or the educational space between, um, be between game makers and, uh, and, 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 and funders. So I uh, would love to talk, Claire, a little bit about um, the work you do at NYU and, and your, your work as a, as a game developer and, and your experience in, in going to the marketplace to get funding and, the, and what you've encountered there? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, even though I teach at NYU uh, at the Game Center, I'm here with the work that I'm doing with my own company, uh, which is the one that actually got uh, uh, fiscal sponsorship. So I have my own company, uh, Fiction Control with Matt Weiss, uh, and we do game design consultancy, we do uh, commissioned work, and we're working on our first independent project, the Myth Machine, and uh, it's a game about uh, the American identity post 9-11 in the hyper-technology work world um, and in the middle of this economic crisis. And these are the things that we say to arts, um, uh, to arts funding or to, to people in the arts and to explain what the game is about and it's not the same language that we would use for commercial funding, but that's what the game is actually about. Um, for us, in a way, uh, working in games uh, as an expressive medium is a way of uh, kind of commenting on the world, providing a lens. Uh, and what we want to do in a way is kind of what the Hamilton musical has done. You know, Hamilton didn't set out to change the way that we understand history, uh, but it has rekindled in uh, interest in this, the, the, this figure through a artistic form in, in, in a work of art in its own right. And so it for kept us, them on the ten dollar bill. Yeah, right. And kept it in the ten dollar bill. Exactly. Uh, so in a way, we want to use um, something that is like light satire, science fiction, uh, to make a comment on the state of affairs right now. Uh, and that's the kind of game that can be a commercial project. And yet, because of the concept, because of where we're going, because we're also in an industry that's risk averse, we are starting. Uh, as a, in a, a prototype phase uh, to make a demo uh, that we can actually show um, and, and kind of gain interest, engage interest in the whole project. Uh, so yeah, we got uh, fiscal sponsorship uh, from the New York Funding for the Arts. 
um, which we just got recently. So right now, they're helping us apply for uh, other grants and finding donors to create this first phase of the of the project. Once we get our demo, we can pitch this to commercial entities, and then that's the end of the nonprofit phase. We are fiscal sponsorship, so we are an, uh, uh, sponsored by a nonprofit, and then we can go in the second phase of development with uh, commercial money. So in a way, like all the explanations that you were given before, is, it, this is a, a new, uh, no, it's not a new model. This is what, in the arts, this is how it works. You prepare something, you prove your concept, and then you can develop it as something commercial in the same way that you can ask for funding for preparing a screenplay or doing research for your documentary. Uh, so in a way, that's, that's the model that we're, we're creating. We're more grounded in a way in the, the arts and the humanities than other projects. Uh, but again, like that's the, we want to uh, call attention to certain social issues through game design and even using you know, specific genres as a commentary. You know, it's like, uh, if you're familiar with the TV show Black Mirror or 1984, right? Uh, that's the kind of model that we're following. And it, it's like a blend of um, almost you know, the commercial approach with a nonprofit approach, and, yes. and uh, um, because that's I mean that's the, the road, the path to sustainability. And well, we hope so. I mean, we're we just started with this. Yeah. One of the, the the issues that comes up, and and you know, again, as I was listening to you, there's a lot of uh, independent developers that work for free for many months, yes. or even complete a game and then they go to a publisher. Uh, and here we have models from the arts that prove that you can work on something and be able to get tax breaks to hire people or even you know, get donors to pay yourself uh, while you are preparing a project that might or might not you know, take off, but at least being able to work and pay the rent at the same time. Yeah. Nick, let's talk about that a little bit. I mean, this, this is not your first rodeo. You've done this, you've done this process, and you do have to cobble a lot of different things together, a lot of different streams to, to sort of fund your vision of, 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 of uh, what the game can be. And at the same time, you also have to keep the lights on, and, and the, you and the, the team have bills and, 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 and rents and mortgages, and uh, how, do you, how do you do it, and sort of how do you um, keep the, the momentum going and, 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 and keep hope alive throughout that entire process? At the same time, you're filling out endless, uh, what, what seemingly an endless array of, of, of different uh, forms and, and grant applications. Yeah, so, I mean, Playmatics is a company of about 15 people, and so, you know, we have uh, keep the lights on issues. Uh, that, that come with that, and the way that we've dealt with that is through, you know, we've, you know, both my business partner Margaret Wallace and I are are lucky in the sense that early on in our careers we were involved in these kind of activities, so we had a history walking into this of being involved in what was at the time called serious games, you know, and 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 had success in that space. And so now as a company, you know, we have been recipients of number a number of grants. Uh, notably from NSF, NIH, and NIMH. Uh, you know, right now the two projects that we have, we have a project that was a Phase One NIH grant that's currently in clinical trials. We are currently working on an NIH grant Phase Two project that will enter random controlled uh, trials later this year. Uh, and we just announced just before this conference uh, Science Game Lab Initiative, which is a hub that we're building and that we're currently pursuing relationships for that will aggregate games for research into a single site that will have a gamified presence to sort of move that. Our company is also currently working on applications for both of the people at the other end of the table. You know, and so for us, you know, for us a lot of this came about because we, you know, part of it is an aesthetic interest that we have in um, you know, solving difficult game design problems and really challenging game design and moving the form forward, which is something that I've been lucky enough to be involved in my entire career. Um, some of that is interest in doing either public good or, or innovative work in the arts, and so a lot of the projects we've done have social good causes attached to them. And, you know, and in my private practice, I do, I guess, what I would call art around uh, games and interactivity, and I'm interested in that. For my, for you know, like just just as part of my professional practice, and part of that was that the landscape changed so dramatically in the time that Playmax has been in existence that we saw sustain a sustainable business model in this practice. Now, I'm not. A lot of that was kind of unique to our situation of having you know a been down that road before, b have had experience and success down that road before, and c, uh, my, you know, Margaret Wallace has has uh, a history of being involved in sort of. Um, 
you know, like, like public health projects and, and sort of, you know, kind of grant projects. So we have a familiarity with the structure. But um, what we found is that for us, it's been a really successful uh, pivot. And we're very, you know, we're very excited about the phase two project that we have moving right now. And we're very excited about, you know, some of the possibilities that we have to move this forward. And for us, really, it's, it's become a part of our company practice to pursue these things. I mean, one thing that's simply a reality of this type of business is that, the cycles on grants are both long and not predictable. Um, so we have to build into our business practice the understanding that we, we forge relationships, we send ships out, and then an, an amount of time is going to pass before we hear back on those ships. And that's just sort of become, you know, interestingly, we've adapted our whole business around that model. Um, and so, you know, when I say that we're in preparation of applications, that's like new, that's what new business development looks like for that part of our business is like, you know, pr producing grants, filling out grants, thinking about what grant relationships are, forging relationships with providers, forging relationships with partners who sometimes bring that information to us or if we forge relationships with in order to facilitate projects that we are interested in and then sort of, you know, cultivating those relationships through, uh, you know, what could be a many month process of hearing back on these things. It seems like an ecosystem has evolved over time. Uh, it, it, it's not 10 years ago where you can't, you know, mention the G word. It's uh, it, it, there. There are places you go. These these are the, these paths have turned into gravel roads. Some of these gravel roads have become paved. And folks on 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 the, the design side sort of know wh wh where to go. So we're in a different place. But I'd like to hear quickly from each of the panels. What piece of advice would you have? Because I'm sure there are a number of people in the audience and, and on the internet who, who are at an initial phase, a seed phase, where they're, they want to turn their idea into action. What's a single piece of advice that, that you would give them as they seek funding, uh, both from everybody's perspective? Great. I'd say I get the information. Um, I just talked about the Department of Education because, of course, I only want you to apply to my program. But. Um, <laughs> But we actually, with the help of ESA, um, a year ago in De December, we hosted a games expo in Washington, D.C. Uh, that was uh, game developers who were funded by SBIR came to, to show their games. Um, very fun event, by the way, for, especially for my 10-year-old. She loved it. Um, but the, uh, the event, uh, 10 different SBIR programs were represented. So you might be surprised to know that uh, Department of Transportation, Department of Agriculture, I think five or six different programs at DOD. Um, obviously, education, NSF, NIH, all fund the, uh, funded games. So get the information. And then um, you know, do your user concept testing. Get that written up in some kind of uh, systematic way to show the funders that um, you're, you have good traction. And then, as I said before, um, you know, get, your, get your team in place. And, and I could go on forever with uh, advice, but I'll stop there. Mark? Yeah, so I, you know, I'm looking, thinking in my head here of every game that we funded so far, and each one of these projects has, in some point in the process, spoken to us, and likely early in the process, to collaborate on a proposal, to work through research goals, work through learning goals, and really design the project towards that end. So my first quick bit of advice would say, get in touch with us, get in touch with us now. It's never too early to do that. And I say that too because a lot of times what people will assume is that coming into NEH is like coming into another funder, where if you have a project that's in place, it's polished, it's ready to go, all that you need is finishing funds, that's enough, when it's not. There's a process that we adhere to, and again, it's tied to working with scholars and teams of scholars and content experts that really does dictate things. And it's a process that's awfully hard to kind of put in post hoc. To bring in a team of historians, say, to a game that's just about to lock code is almost impossible if we're going to allow for some influence there. So build it in early into the process. Talk to us as early as possible. And given the range of games that we've funded, which, which will go um, from everything from literature, like Tracy Fullerton's Walden game, to Native American culture, US history, the history of medicine, topics as diverse as the humanities are, um, the processes do remain both similar, again, in the way that we have to have research incorporated, but wildly different in terms of how you should frame it, and in terms of grantsmanship, really, too. And that's oftentimes one of the biggest st stumbling blocks. So talk to us, talk to us early, we will walk you through the process, and we will help you uh, to really flesh your project out in a way that will speak to an NEH set of reviewers. 
That Walden game, by the way, is just utterly stunning. It's, it's a beautifully yeah, developed it's, it's game. Gorgeous. Looking forward to that coming out. We had a group of congressional staffers, uh, and we toured USC, and we did a, a, a games and learning symposium for them, and they couldn't believe how, how fantastic that game yeah, was. Yeah, and just a little plug, tomorrow morning, the chairman of the NEH, William Adams, will be speaking with Tracy Fullerton about the design process of Walden, um, and they'll be doing it right here at about 10 a.m. So this seems like it's a partnership as much as it is as it is. You go and you say, here's my finished proposal, here's 500 pages on what I think this can do, or five pages on what I think this could do. It's, it's almost like the beginning of a, a partnership relationship. It's, it's less funder and designer, it's, it's more partner. Are you finding that in New York State? Is that the type of, is it? Oh, absolutely. Uh, in fact, we may not call it a partnership, or we, we have that reserved for specific collaborations. But NISCA is the kind of funder that, um, especially for nonprofit organizations that are supporting you, uh, it's kind of like a family that, you know, once you've gone, you know, through the hoops and you have your first successful grant, you're really, we're really a long-term investor. So even though, again, uh, $30,000 for one year may not sound like much, but if you have $90,000 over three years, that begins to add up to money. Uh, I have organizations in my portfolio that we have been supporting for 10, 20 years. And that, over time, is where the partnership is because we stay in touch with them, we uh, learn about what they're doing in order to support you, and we learn how to better support the organization so that we can uh, stay uh, true to what's happening out there and the fast pace of this changing world. Again, I want to emphasize uh, what Mark and Ed have both said. Get in touch with your funder. It, uh, you know, it may be off the funding cycle, but I, we cannot, I cannot underscore the importance of that um, dialogue initially before you even begin to do a grant. Just call, find out if you're in the right spot. There's a lot of support uh, that you're given way up front. But also, what I will add though is call your funder too. I'm not sure in your case, but like in the case with media film and individual artists, as I was saying earlier, because we don't have quite the clout in the year that we'd also always like to have it, we work very hard for uh, supporting networks of individuals out there, again, across professions and across disciplines. I would really encourage, especially anyone in New York State, to take advantage of the Electronic Media and Film, New York Media Arts map, for example. There's over 157 organizations on that map. It's a Google-based design map, uh, location-based, really easy to navigate and use. And what we've done over the years is identify all these organizations that have support systems. They have funding, they have support systems, they have other networks of individual artists, makers, creators, so that you can go to IFP, for example, you can go to G4C, for example, you can go to uh, Made in New York, for example, find other people uh, like yourself and not like yourself, which is actually very, very beneficial. Network, gain information, and therefore broaden your knowledge out as well in terms of really taking advantage of all the many, many advantages uh, that we do have. We're, we're short on time, but I want to hear from the artist, and I want to ask a two-part question uh, to, to both Claire and Nick. Uh, first is the one piece of advice question that, that I ask, because I, I think that your perspective would, would, would be helpful. Then the second part is about sustainability. You get the funding. And it's like, wow, and then you hit the old crap button because it's like, what do I do now? And I only have three years in, or, or at the outside. Sometimes it's two years, sometimes it's less. How do you sustain beyond that? We had this problem with Glass Lab. We had $31 million. But before we knew it, we were staring down the barrel at the end of that, uh, the, the, that, that grant. So piece of advice and, and how do you sustain past the initial uh, grant? So the piece of advice would be for developers to start thinking about their work as art and actually talk about it as art. Uh, and it seems kind of silly, but uh, we've inherited a lot of vocabulary from the software industry, uh, thinking about our games as exclusively products and not about uh, expressive me an expressive medium that can tell something about where we live, how we understand you know, the human condition. Uh, it, like, why should people care beyond the features of the game? And it, kinda, it seems kind of obvious, but I still see this a lot, that this is one of the barriers in order to get funding that we communicate with the funding um, organizations, and we still talk with the jargon of the software industry, and that kind of goes over people's heads, and it's not really that interesting either. Um, so that would be the, the, the big things. Like if you want arts funding, think like an artist. Uh, as for sustainability, because we just got our own um, 
uh, the fiscal sponsorship, uh, we still we're still applying for grants, so we are uh, in the process of applying for grants and figuring that out. Uh, but so far, when we realized that this was a possible way of actually funding an art game, uh, it was a relief in a way of having an alternative to what the publishing model in games is right now. Uh, because every, also everybody's going to the same sources of funding, everybody's following the same uh, patterns the, back to the idea of working for free. So knowing that there's other alternatives in a way is liberating creatively too. Uh, but we can report next year. We can tell <laughs> how that's going. All right, Nick, let's, let, let's close it out. What's, what's your experience been? What piece of advice and how do you sustain? I mean, my piece of advice and the sustaining piece are kind of similar in a way, which is that these are partnership projects. You are probably not a company that has a health professional sitting in your office who's been doing research on your topic for the last 10 years and a game development studio that's been working for the last six years to build something. You probably don't have full-time professors of the humanities lying around doing QA for you, right? So in all likelihood, you don't have all the pieces internally to facilitate these relationships. What most likely you're partnering with people. Like, for example, the NIH phase two grant that we mentioned, um, that is with Dr. Darian Raposa and Dr. Bethany Raff, and they're both very uh, proficient, very well-known, and very established researchers who bring that expertise to the table. We don't bring that expertise. And as you pursue these kinds of relationships, if it's something you want to do, those relationships are critical. Not because those are people who are going to lead the grant, because we live in a number of different grant relationships where we're primary investigators, or the researcher is a primary investigator, or we work with an artist who leads the project, or we lead the project with an artist. We have all of those relationships. But it's because the because th this is not money that's just sort of sitting in the world waiting to bestow upon your genius, right? This is money that's designed for a purpose and it has intents in mind. So Mark, for example, mentioned the sort of humanities needs of, those, of, of the projects that NEH funds. And so if you are interested in those relationships, you need to form those kind of partnerships and NEH will help you, but that has to be part of your thinking. For things like, like Department of Ed, methodology and, and efficaciousness are really critical, and that's a language of education. It's not just like what you would happen to think of in testing, there's a science of that. And having partners who can bring that to the table are, I think, really critical to those projects because if you haven't been paying a lot of attention to this, education has been kind of sniffing around games for like the past 15 years, and they've gotten really good at thinking about games and knowing what games are good for. So there are relationships that are going to make sense, and there are ways that things work. I don't, that doesn't mean that if you have a vision for a project and you want to push it to multiple groups, it's impossible. It just means you need to think about your project in relation to those groups and what those groups are looking for. Because if you can, they'll often help you find the bridge to what you want to do. And I, I can't tell you how many conversations I've had where people in these organizations are just kind of looking for ways for you to match the mission that they have with something that you're passionate about. And the nice thing about that is that those relationships um, give you the ability to pursue future relationships with the same people. And so forging those relationships open up, opens up doors like that. So we're, you know, what we're proud of at Playmatics in a lot of ways is the relationships we forged. I think all of this underscores the fundamental tension between art and commerce, right? When you're in the commerce stream and you go to a potential funder, you're looking, they're looking for ROI. They want to get return on, on, on their investment. When you're making art, it's, I mean, this, is, this is, goes back to the, the days of Michelangelo and Medici, right? And you, you, in, 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 in the, uh, the, 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 the Borgia Popes and that sort of thing. And it, and it still goes on today. But there are funding streams. The good news is that there are funding streams out there. You've got um, some well-trod paths, and the paths are getting wider. And you've got more and more people in this space. So with that, I want to say thank you to our panel. Thank you, Ed Metz. Thank you, Mark Ruppel. Thank you, uh, Karen Helmerson, Clara Fernandez-Vara, and Nick Fortuno. Thank you very much. Thank you.